Hello, good people. Welcome to our show. Hello, bad people. Welcome to our show. Hello, anyone who wanna learn more about marketing. And today we have an interesting topic: cookie collapse. Welcome. To, it's very important today to know what to do, how to behave, how to get results, sales, leads from your marketing campaigns. I'm so excited to discuss this topic with John Greenfield. How are you? I'm doing great, Anatoly. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, big pleasure. Wanna learn more? You know, I found you. I got it. I need to invite. I need to learn more <laughs> because I'm a student on this life. You know, I need to learn every single day. Jeff, before we start, just tell more about yourself, experience, background, and anything that can help our listeners to learn more about you. Sure. I mean, I've got three decades of experience in terms of business and marketing. I primarily started my career on the brand side, building out large-scale marketing campaigns, uh, some of the most efficient in all of marketing history that have added billions of dollars of value to companies. And then it was around 2008 or so is when I saw this kind of uh, loophole, if you will, in digital marketing, where all of a sudden we had more marketing players that were there, and there was this concept of last click that came in, and I knew there had to be a better way. And so as a result, that led me down this path to create one of the first multi-touch attribution companies, C3 Metrics, built that up, uh, served some of the largest marketers on the planet with that. Uh, it did a lot of work and even got MRC accreditation, which is a big deal for an ad tech company. Grew the company about 171% year over year growth and exited there in 2019 thinking I was never going to go back to measurement, thinking I had done everything that there was to do. And then in 2021, two years ago, all of a sudden things changed again. It was like the bottom dropped out of measurement and the stuff that I had created back in 2008 that was working great, all of a sudden wasn't going to work anymore. Uh, and that meant an entire generation of marketers going back to last click, which is just not acceptable because when you're focused on last click, you're measuring down at the bottom of the funnel. You're not actually trying to figure out what is driving interest and awareness and, and growing your business. You're just servicing people that already know about you. And that's not good. And so that led me down this path of trying to figure out what can we do because of all of these privacy changes. And that's where the power of AI comes in. And that led me to build out the next generation of attribution, which is AI driven attribution. And that's Probolytics. And that's kind of in a nutshell where we are right now. Nice. Awesome. Love it. Love it. It's interesting. When I started my digital journey, I paid for clicks like five, 10 cents. And I didn't spend so much time by learning about customer persona. <laughs> Today, I can't because I need to pay five, ten dollars <laughs> no, per click. It's a lot. So can you tell more about cookie collapse for someone who is not familiar, who doesn't know about that? Uh, what, why it uh, it's going to collapse or uh, collapse and uh, your tips what to do? <laughs> sure. So. To back up a little bit, the entire internet, all of digital is built along this concept of cookies. And cookies essentially is a small little piece of computer code that sits on your computer that sites can leave there. And there's really two types of cookies. There's first party cookies and third party cookies. First party cookies are when you go to a website like Amazon and you're automatically logged in. You just go there, you don't have to log in because what Amazon did is they wrote a cookie. And first party means that it was written and under the domain of amazon.com. So when you're on Amazon, they can read and write amazon.com cookies. And when you go to another website like the New York Times, they cannot read amazon.com cookies. Only that domain can read those cookies. And so anytime you go someplace and you're automatically logged in, you go to Google Chrome and you're logged in, that also is a first party cookie. So first party cookies are how you identify yourself to these sites. Uh, there's this other type of cookie called third party cookies. Third party cookies are when you go to a website and someone else can write a cookie. So when you go to the New York Times and there's an ad there, uh, and let's say that ad has double click ad code in there, which double click is part of the whole Google ecosystem, they can write a double click cookie. Now, what that means is, is that they can't read a New York Times cookie, but when you go to another website, uh, let's say you go to the wallstreetjournal.com and another ad gets served up. They're also serving that double click cookie. And what they can do is, is that they can see that you were just on the New York Times and they can see that you saw that cookie. They can even see that you clicked on the cookie because 
that's their own cookie. And so what has happened throughout the years is that the way the whole ad ecosystem works, and the reason this is important is because, remember, the internet's free and it's all advertising based, very similar to how Netflix, Netflix originally had this pay for play model. You had to pay to become a member to watch Netflix. And then all of a sudden they've now come up with these new tiers, which are lower cost, but you have to watch ads, similar to how TV is. So the internet started just like TV. It's free, uh, but we're going to show you ads so it helps pay for things. That whole advertising concept is based upon a combination of third-party cookies and first-party cookies. And the combination of those allow advertisers to see how you traverse a pa across the web. Another great example of that is you go to somebody's website, like a, like a retail site, like Macy's.com, and you're looking at some shoes. And then you go uh, 10 minutes later and you're in Facebook feed, and all of a sudden in Facebook, you see those same shoes advertised to you. That's because of third-party cookies, the Facebook third-party cookies. So retargeting and all of those really cool concepts of digital advertising are all based upon these third-party cookies. So we have all, everything has been built up upon this big, if you will, pyramid of this technology. And now what's going to happen is Google, who is the major browser, almost 70% of people around the world use Google Chrome in order to navigate the web. They have stated that they're going to get rid of third-party cookies because it allows people to track you and, and consumers and, and the law around the world has said that's maybe not a good thing. And so they're going to kill off third-party cookies. Now, What's important to say is that third-party cookies have been gone for a while in Safari. They've been gone for a while in, in uh, mobile Safari. Uh, so in the iOS world, third-party cookies aren't a thing. But in the Android world and the desktop world, they're still a thing. They're still alive. But now they're going to be going away uh, this time next year in 2024, Q3 2024. So what that means is... The way that everybody operates in the advertising world is about to change drastically. The way you go about, like even your retargeting, getting people who just came to your site who didn't buy, getting them to see ads right away, that's going to change. But more importantly than anything else is that you don't just buy ads to buy ads. You buy ads to sell stuff, to generate leads, to get people interested in your service. And how do you know whether what you're doing is working or not? Well, that's where measurement comes in. And since the entire ad ecosystem is built upon this pyramid of cookies, if you will, and since the pyramid is going to topple, so is ad measurement as we know it. And we're not talking about for small businesses. We're talking about for some of the largest companies in the world are measuring and targeting based upon third-party cookies and that's all going to change overnight. Uh, and you would say, well, they've got to be prepared for this. They're like the largest advertisers in the world, right? They've got to know what's going on. They've been seeing the writing on the wall. Google has been telling us for the last couple of years, hey, get ready. This is going to happen. They even put it off for a year. So, of course, they're ready. And I'm here to tell you, because I deal with some of these very large companies, that they are not ready. That. <laughs> The largest advertisers in the world are not ready for this. No one is prepared for this because the current system is still working. And there's a tendency as a human, I don't like change. Change is not good. I don't make change happen. And how can I prepare for something when the current scenario is still working? And so that kind of gives you an overview of what's going to happen. But essentially, the ad ecosystem is, for many marketers, going to collapse. That's essentially what's going to happen. Now, the problem that we have is that most marketers today are much younger than me. And if you're in your 30s or even your 40s or your 20s and you've grown up in digital marketing, what that means is, is that you live in a world of Google Analytics, which is now just switched over to Google Analytics 4. But you've been taught that data is the new oil. Data is valuable. We have to have more data. The more data we have, the more valuable it is. But we're now entering this new world, this privacy-centric world, where we're going to have less and less 
and less data. For anyone who's listening, who's lived and, and does any paid social advertising, you've probably noticed just over the last year, your ability to target what used to be available in there to buy as targets are now not available. Clients will show me what their ad manager looks like inside of Facebook. And you get all these warnings that say, this is not available anymore. Uh, my daughter who works, who used to run advertising for a very large ad dealer group years ago, used to be able to buy specific vehicles. If someone drove a specific vehicle, if they leased it and their lease was about to expire. So you could target somebody who drove a particular pickup truck whose lease was going to expire in about six months. Now you can buy age, you can buy gender, you can buy location and things that they like. And that's about it. And this is moving backwards for a lot of people who are used to living in digital. We're moving back to a time of before digital. And yeah. that makes people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s a little nervous because we've never lived in a time like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I, I can feel th uh, that I will get a lot of new marketing messages. Uh, you love fashion, buy this T-shirt. You know, my uh, my most expensive T-shirt costs like uh, ten dollars. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yeah, and uh, uh, of course, people wanna save their privacy, but if you get irrelevant marketing messages, uh, it's annoying. It's annoying. And Jeff, you 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 sh shared a good big story about that, you know. But what uh, about solution? Can you give solution? What to do if big companies, marketers are not ready? But we will be on the same boat. We need to find the way what to do. So tell what to do then. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's really the big question is that we need to go back to a time where we're doing more testing and learning in our mm -hmm. marketing campaigns. We've had a run for a very long period of time where we were able to just kind of do the same thing this month that we did last month, this quarter that we did last quarter, and it seemed to kind of work. Uh, but we're now living in a world where we have to focus more on incremental improvement. What is actually moving the needle for us? And what I mean by incremental is there's a certain level of leads or sales or inquiries that you're going to get every month if you're a large enough brand. Advertising is going to raise that up a little bit. So you need to figure out what is the actual contribution that each particular tactic and creative is giving to your campaign. Now, so there's the gold standard of doing that. The gold standard of doing that is doing what we call A-B testing, where you go in and you pick a specific geo or a city and you compare, you say, okay, this city is like this city and this city, I'm going to do something new. And in the other city, I'm going to do something, I'm going to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. So I'm only doing it in this one city and you let it run for a period of time. And then you look to see, how many additional sales did I get in this city with this new creative? And then you can, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, hey, that's what made a difference. That's the gold standard. And that's always recommended when you're testing in to new types of strategies. Like, for example, CTV, podcast advertising. The nice things about these types of things is that at scale, you can do these in very specific geos to then demonstrate hey, this is working, we should roll it out to more cities and improve upon that. So that's, that's number one. That's a given in terms of testing new things, we should be doing that. The other thing we need to do is we need to pan back the camera a bit. We have spent the last you know, 15 years hyper-focused on user-level journeys, meaning being able to track users from the moment they got exposed to an ad all the way through. And we've been able to what they call stitch together, put together this whole user journey. And we there's been a fixation in marketing that we can look at these user journeys. And then from that, we can figure out what's working and what's not working. And, and when, when all of that data was available, meaning every single impression and every single click was available, then we could defer information from it. And that's what I did in the early days back in 2008. But now... 
you can't get that level of data everywhere. You can get click data when people come to your website, but you cannot get the impression data. For example, when you run a Facebook campaign, it will tell you how many people were exposed to your ad each day, but you can't actually get the ID of each user who was exposed to an ad to then build it all together. But the problem also is that we now have these new digital channels that what I call are no click digital channels. For example, podcasts. We're kind of on a podcast video cast right now. And if someone were to buy an ad in this, there's nothing anyone to click on if they're listening to it on their way to work or at home at night. So how do you measure something that there's nothing to click on? And CTV is like TV. I can't go and reach up and click on my TV way up there. So how do we measure these new channels? And we have to assume that next year, next month, there's going to be something else new that is not clickable. So if we pan the camera far enough back and we get a big enough perspective and we look at how things were before digital, before digital, marketing had a toolbox of television, radio, direct mail, and that was pretty much it, print. That was it. And, and what would happen is marketers would sit in a room, they would come up with these great ideas. They would also do things like you talked about a moment ago, Anatoly. Uh, they would talk about personas. They would say, our customer is Jane. She's 23 years old. She lives in New York City. She has a dog. Her boyfriend's name is this. Our other customer is Jill. She's 37 years old. And they would build out all these personas. And then they would build out campaigns that would be for these folks. And then they would... So it was a very creative process. And then they would build out these campaigns and roll out the ads on TV, radio, print, direct mail. And then they would sit back and wait for several months. And then after several months, they would do these lift studies where they would do research and they would do uh, surveys to determine, was there an increase in awareness of the business? And then they would wait several months later, and then they would do what's called a marketing mix model, where they would do a whole analysis of mathematical equations to look to see what were the sales and how did this campaign contribute? What was the incremental value that this campaign brought? Now, that was great back in those days. And marketing mix modeling is how most brands were built. But what happened is that Digital moves so fast and there's a tendency to want to get in on the weeds and marketing mix models are a lot of math, a lot of data gathering, and it takes sometimes most brands only do them once a year. So how can I, as a digital marketer, look at data once a year to guide me on my campaign? It's not sufficient. That's why multi-touch attribution came out because I could hook up all of these pipes and all of a sudden data would flow in and I could log into a dashboard and I could see like updated data on a regular basis. But now that data is not going to be available anymore. So now what we have to do is we have to look at what did we like about attribution? What did we not like about it? What did we like about marketing mix modeling and what did we not like about it? Well, we didn't like about it that it was this big project. We also didn't like that it took forever to get the results and that it was only done once a year. I would want that, but I want it more frequent. And attribution didn't include incremental impact. It only showed the value. As a marketer, I need to know what actually moved the needle. The other thing I didn't like about attribution is that when it, it, it was great in terms of telling me what happened, but it didn't tell me what to do next. It relied on me, the marketer, to say, here's what I should do next. I should do next based upon who my best players were yesterday. So now I have to be creative, but now I have to figure out some math as a marketer, this concept of being data-driven. Math is not... Well, mathematicians will tell you that math is creative, but to people that want to do marketing, math is not that creative. It's, it's a lot of numbers. And so with AI, what we're able to do 
is merge those two worlds together. We're able to get a more frequent return of results. We're able to hook up pipes. We're also able to not rely upon user level data so that AI allows us to bridge the gap from user level to aggregated data. So we're not violating any type of privacy issues. And with AI, we're also able to focus in on a unifying metric. Because remember we talked about those no click digital channels. We can focus in on impressions which is what all of these channels have in common. If there's one thing they have, not everybody clicks on things, but we do know how many impressions, how many views we have in market. And in the old days, we used to call that reach. What is the reach? How many people are we trying to reach? So we can look at that on a daily basis, but then we can also ask the machines to do a little bit more work. And what I can ask the machines is I can say, hey, you have all of this data on how things were yesterday. So for the next month, can you give me, if my budget is the same and I'm playing with the same players, can you run through hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of simulations and output for me? What would be the best possible combination? Meaning, who should I give more money to? Who should I give less money to over the next 30, 60, or 90 days? And then we let the machines do the math because we're marketers, we're not mathematicians. And the machine gives me the best possible plan. And then that way as a marketer, I can spend more time being creative and spend more time on the art versus the math part of things. So that yeah. really the solution is, you know, everyone talks about, oh, I'm worried about chat GPT, I'm worried about AI. This stuff is just very sophisticated math. And, and it is so much better at doing this math than we are. And so we need to, the next generation of marketers, what we're going to learn how to do is rely on the machines more than ever so that we can be creative because that's really what we're here for. And here's the big secret about marketing. 70% of the value of your marketing and 70% of the ROI is not from where you place your ads. It's the messaging, it's the creative. Yeah. And that's what human beings are best at is coming up with those ideas. Nice, yeah, well explained. I love it, love it, yeah, you know. And uh, uh, you, remo you remind me, Jeff Coyle, uh, he spoke on my podcast, uh, co-founder of Market News, and he told me, in the future, we will have three companies. The first company will develop AI, the second company will implement, and the third company will be obsolete. Who can leave the trade, you know? <laughs> so, and, but I want to ask about this calculation with AI uh, to learn. Uh, I mean, like, uh, you know, uh, many content creators uh, can complain that AI can mislead or to provide their own data uh, or uh, low quality data. Uh, can you tell about this calculation? I mean, like, if we can can we rely today on AI? Of course, I, I'm pretty sure that AI will be, be the future. But what about calculation this data today? Can we rely on this data and how we can check? Because if I create any content with AI, I spend time editing, analyzing, and thinking, is it good or not? I can play with prompts to spend time because I know the topic. If you ask me to write about weight loss, I can't. If you ask me about, I don't know, finance, I can't. But about marketing, SEO, I can spend time. I can analyze uh, getting results. So let us know about accuracy of this data. <laughs> well, I, I, I would borrow from former President Ronald Reagan, who said, trust but verify. Yeah. So when it comes to AI, especially in content writing, you, you know, the nice thing is that we've got right at our fingertips the ability through chat GPT to create content. And then we can open up another browser and find resources to see if it's correct. I've played around with chat GPT and I found that it has been designed to make me like it. Uh, it is, that's what it's design was, was, was done was so that people would like it, people would utilize it. And as a result, it always produces a result. And that result always sounds correct. 
But I have found that many times it is incorrect. In fact, especially when it comes to testing it with code, you can, you know, sometimes when you're doing coding, you get bugs in your code. And so you go to ChatGPT and ask it for solutions. And it, it, it gives you an incredible answer. But in many instances, it doesn't actually answer the question, but it sounds like it is. It almost sounds like a politician many times because it, it, you know how politicians will talk in circles. They won't actually answer a direct question. That's what I feel like ChatGPT has been designed to do. But when you use the basis of AI to do mathematical equations, which is what the basis of, of attribution is, uh, you always go in and you verify the results. That's the most important thing is you always have to have a checker in there. You always have to have a QA process that is confirming the results because in any type of technical endeavor, whenever you're building anything out, uh, you, your, your concept is it's always going to run perfectly. But I've been involved in this space long enough to know that things don't always run perfectly. And you don't always see it when there's issues. So you always have to have checks that are running. As many processes as you have running, you have to have a check that confirms those results along the way. Otherwise, because what happens is when you're doing math, you put in one input, you get another output. And the output looks like a real number. So unless you're checking along the way, you have no idea to know whether that output is correct or not. So you have to build your programs in such a way that you have checks along the way to make sure that the basic math is correct. Uh, but ChatGPT, remember, is, is a politician. It's been designed to give you a, a very nice result, uh, which may or may not be correct. In fact, many times it doesn't even answer your question, but it is polite. That is one thing. It's very polite, uh, which is great. <laughs> yeah, I think... ChatGPT is not a golden button, uh, for example, and uh, only great writers can get great results with ChatGPT. <laughs> if you can't write, you you can't estimate what kind of content you got. I mean, like quality or not. So it's better to spend time to learn how to write, to write a lot. Then you can, uh, I think, estimate the quality and play with prompts. And I usually don't rely a lot uh, to generate content with ChatGPT. I collect my data myself and edit content because I'm a terrible writer. But when I collect <laughs> data and uh, add to ChatGPT and ask, please edit all this information. Uh, and yeah, uh, ChatGPT can write much better than me, much better, you know. Uh, and we got like mentioned on CNN, Forbes, Business Insider, because of editing content on ChatGPT. I collected data, uh, wrote press releases, uh, and yeah, uh, CNN like it. If CNN likes uh, press releases, that means uh, it's quality, you know. <laughs> so well, I think you're, you're pointing to a very important point there, which is, is that you know, in and of itself, it's not that great, but it's all about the human being that's behind it. You know what you want to write about. Yeah. You're gathering the content. You're putting it in a format that's ready to go. And you're asking it just like you would ask an assistant who has great writing skills and knows proper punctuations and paragraph structure. You're asking your assistant to put it together for you. And I think that's a great use case for it uh, because it is essentially a great assistant, but you have to be able to figure out how to utilize it and how to fit it into your workflow. Uh, but for that use case, it, it's, it's great. And it's helped you, like you said, it's worked out very well for you, which is wonderful. Yeah, nice. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned about creativity. 70% of results uh, depend on creativity. I couldn't agree more with that because uh, all marketing depends on creativity. Let me share a short story about uh, Lloyd Richards. He published a book 11 years ago. Uh, it's interesting about the story that uh, he spent 14 years to write a single book. 14 years, more than a decade to write a single book. Then he published and couldn't sell for a long time. Like random sales, nothing special. Then his daughter posted content on TikTok. Uh, from an account with zero followers, this video became viral. And today this book is bestseller on Amazon. Uh, so a short video, short video, deserved 50 million views. 
one of them was mine because <laughs> I want to figure out how to film such videos to get uh, a lot of views, viral videos. And uh, what I found on this video, it's creative. As you mentioned, creativity. And uh, this short video was creative, stand out from the rest, not like many other videos. Not with special design, nice looking design. Very simple design, nothing special, but creative. And uh, can you tell about creativity? Uh, how to become creative in marketing when we, you have a lot of competitors? Um, I don't know, many ideas are implemented. How to stand off from the rest and become creative? <laughs> well, the key is, is that you can't, you, uh, we're all creatives. We're, we all have creativity, but you can't, you can't force it. You can't sit down. It's kind of like everyone understands the concept of writer's block where you say, hey, I, I'm going to write a story like in this example. And you sit down and the page is blank. You can't write. You don't have an idea or anything. So you can't you can't force that out. And when you talk to uh, very creative people, artists and writers, they will tell you that this idea, they didn't come up with it. It, it came out of them. The idea was was it, it came from some other place. They didn't invent it, they felt it. And so what's important is that with creativity, you can't force it out. You sometimes have to retreat a bit and let the ideas ruminate and stir a little bit. For me, I find that I'm the most creative between sleep and awake. And I get some of my best ideas from my dreams. Now, mm -hmm. this leads to a whole kind of another discussion of like, well, you know, a lot of people will tell you that they don't dream. You know, I, I don't dream. And for a number of years, I, I, I didn't feel like that I was dreaming either. But my wife and daughter every day, they would talk about their dreams. And I would be like, you know, I really don't dream. But what I found is that I was dreaming. I didn't remember it primarily because I wasn't getting enough sleep. You know, my wife would go to sleep at seven, eight o'clock at night and get nine, 10 hours of sleep. And I would stay up as an entrepreneur until two or three o'clock in the morning, working, sitting in bed with the laptop, typing away. And I would go to sleep exhausted and my mind would dream, but I wouldn't remember it because I was too exhausted. So what I found is I said, you know, I really want to dream. I feel like that this is a place for where ideas are going to come from. So I made a point to take a notebook and a pen and put it right beside my bed. And, and I, I tried to follow my wife's lead and start to go to bed early. And when I did, I would wake up in the morning. I'm like, oh, that wasn't real. That was a dream. And I'd sit down and I'd start writing it down. And it didn't matter whether it didn't make sense to me. It didn't matter if it was strange, but it was there. And sometimes I'd have like a picture of something that I saw in the dream. And so I would try to draw it. And of course, you can never draw what you see in your brain. It's almost impossible. It's an interpretation, but I would write it down. And then I started having these journals for years of my dreams and everything. And then I would think of something and I would go back in the book and I would see, oh, I had, it was one piece of one dream and another piece of something else. And it would kind of stick to me. So what I find is one of the best ways to be creative, because remember, you can't force it. It's got to flow from some other place. And you need to make certain that you're taking care of your mind and your body. And one of the best ways to do that is to make sure you get enough sleep. So if you're trying to be creative and you're only sleeping four hours a night because you have so much going on, you need to double down on your sleep and get at least eight or nine hours a night. I, I would also say, I would add to that, that it's not just sleep. You also have to make sure you're feeding your body the right nutrients. If you're drinking soda every day and you're eating a lot of you're, you're eating a lot of sugar and you're smoking cigarettes and you're drinking too much and you're not healthy, I, I would say that you're 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 not going to get the full level of creativity that you need. You need to you need to treat this body well because you only get one shot at this body. You know this body. But what's amazing about our body is that. We all know that if we were to go to our car, our gasoline powered car and put water in the gas tank, we would not be surprised if the car didn't work. We all know that. And yet we can fill our bodies with junk. And yet our bodies are able to somehow make it through until they don't. 
till they we get sick someday. So you gotta you gotta get enough sleep. You gotta feed your body really well. The other thing is that since work from home is really good, but the problem is is that when we worked in the office, we would get in our car or we'd get on a bus and we'd drive into work or we would take the train into work and then we would walk from the garage or walk from the bus station into the office. Then we would sit down for a couple hours. We would get up for a coffee break. Then we'd sit down for a couple hours, get up and walk to lunch and then go back home again. So there was a lot of movement during the day of our body. Now, because we work from home, we have officially become a nation of couch potatoes. We are sitting more than we ever have before. So not only do we have to sleep, we got to eat properly. We got to move our bodies. We got to move uh, at, at least a little bit every day. So you got to exercise. And then you also have to stretch your mind a bit. We cannot be so hyper-focused on on just our business and our, our ideas and just trying to be creative. We have to stretch our mind out. So we have to read other things in order to move our mind to a different place. Read some history books, read something old, go, go to the library and just whatever book hits your fancy, just take it home and read it. Even if it has nothing to do with what you're working on, all of a sudden you will find the idea will pop into your head. And yeah. that's how you get creative. You got to take good care of your body, your mind, and your soul. And that's when the creativity really rock and rolls for you. Yeah. You know, your wife is amazing. Uh, yes, I, she is. <laughs> yeah, I agree with your wife 100%. <laughs> sleep is very important. Yeah. And I never fight with myself. If I want to sleep, I go to sleep. <laughs> you know? uh, because, uh, yeah, I remember when I was much younger, uh, I tried to work hard and without having enough sleep, but productivity was low, you know. <laughs> and uh, today, um, yeah, of course, after reading many books, I got it. It's very important to sleep. And uh, I remember, I don't remember the exact name of this book, but the author uh, shared what you can do. Go to sleep now. Go to sleep. <laughs> you need to have the sleep. Uh, yeah. And I think we, we can uh, record another episode, you know, <laughs> for health podcast when I have it, <laughs> you know, because, yeah, I love all your tips. It's very important. And uh, yeah, great tips uh, to how to be creative. You need to uh, do something different, you know, to go to another place, to sleep well, yeah, to eat healthy food 100%. Yeah, I think uh, uh, if you eat junk food, drink soda, uh, don't spend time uh, in gym, uh, running, just choose any activities, I don't know how you can be productive. You can't, you can't. <laughs> yeah, because your body uh, is responsible for all your energy. And I see, Jeff, you have a lot of energy. You, uh, I felt that it's better to ask uh, how you get this energy, but you replied. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Jeff, I want to ask about your experience. What I found uh, in my company uh, that we usually get high results with clients who understand what we do. For example, uh, if uh, we help with SEO, uh, it's important that clients understand what SEO means, how to create high quality content, why it's important to get more traffic value than getting more traffic, many different insights. Uh, if my clients don't understand, I tell them, spend time by learning. Just take my course, learn from Lily Ray, Jeff Coyle, go to YouTube, go to Google, read books, listen to audio podcasts, find your loving format. Don't force yourself with uh, best practices that you need to read blog posts and you can get everything. No, just find your loving format. Uh, understand how it works, then you can hire me or any other experts, you know, just uh, to go ahead. Let's imagine you started today from scratch without any experience, knowledge, skills. Forget about anything you know about marketing. What will you do today if you started from scratch? That's a great question. If I started from scratch today, because things, you know, this is the thing about marketing, especially digital marketing. You know, we used to always say years ago that, a month in the digital world and the internet was like a year in the offline world. 
And things have been kind of stagnant for a little while in digital, but I think a lot of marketers are really all of a sudden going to start to get used to that. It used to be that Google would update like every couple of months, a major shift in their algorithm. Uh, but now we're starting to see some big updates that are starting to occur. And with this whole cookie collapse, this is a whole big major shift. And as a result, experienced marketers, they may have the experience, but their foundation is now broken. There's cracks in it. So the first thing that I would recommend is I spent the better part of the summer looking at all of these changes and trying to put together essentially a course, a series of articles to talk to people through what's occurred in the ecosystem. I, I'm a big fan of history, especially when it comes to marketing, because you can't understand where things are headed to next until you understand how we got to where we are right now. And so for that reason, I put together a attribution certification course that's available at attributioncertified.com. It'll actually redirect to the Provolytic site where you can sign up. You can enroll for free. It actually has a certificate. Oh, my God. That is somebody very furry. Who is that, Anatoly? I got to ask. Uh, Oscar. <laughs> Oscar. All right. Oscar, yeah. <laughs> Oscar loves attribution. That's why after, yeah, Oscar jumped up like that. <laughs> yeah. But, we put together this course, which is at LinkedIn. You get a certificate for LinkedIn, but it talks you through the whole history of advertising before digital all the way up through today. It actually covers some of the things that we talked about here today, but goes into much more detail so that when you complete the certification, you've got a good foundation from which then you can build. Because once you understand how we got to where we are, you'll also understand what are the limitations that are now in place? Because what happens right now is that if you were to start fresh, you would think cookies are going to be around for a long time. You wouldn't know. And you don't want to start learning about policies and procedures that in six months are going to be gone. So one way to actually get ahead and get above everything is to go through attribution, uh, that attribution certification, get it done, and then you'll have a solid foundation. That's that's what I would recommend for someone to get started. Mm -hmm. I would also recommend as questions come up, it would be a great learning process to have one tab open to Google, have another tab open to ChatGPT, ask ChatGPT questions, get the answers, and then verify them. Because a great learning process would be able to learn how to ask chat GPT questions and how to validate those. Because one of the things that I'm sure you mentioned this earlier was about the value of understanding the prompts. Because you ask chat GPT a question and then it's not, they give you an answer, but it doesn't go into the level of detail you want. So you go through and you ask like literally nine different iterations of that question till finally you get the answer you're looking for. So the last question to always ask ChatGPT when you get the answer you're looking for is to ask ChatGPT, how do I ask this question from the beginning so I get here? Meaning, ask ChatGPT to teach you how to ask better questions. Because as humans, we're used to just being in conversation. And that's ChatGPT is great about that. But just like another human being, you need to be very specific in order to get the answer. They Essentially, like we said earlier, ChatGPT is a great assistant, but with assistance, you have to be very specific about what you need. And so that's always the last question to ask ChatGPT, but then you get the answer you want and then you validate it. And that can be a great learning process as well uh, to be able to go through that. Those would be my two recommendations. AttributionCertified.com to get your uh, free attribution certification to get up to speed. And then ask questions to ChatGPT and learn how to ask better questions. Nice, awesome, awesome. Love it, love it. Jeff, I have my final question about the future. Uh, <laughs> you sure. have great experience with past. You know how things are going on in the present, but future. Uh, we need, uh, what I like in marketing, we need to adapt 
all the time. It doesn't matter. Google can bring something new, uh, change the policy. Uh, even if you have some channels that work well, it doesn't mean uh, all these channels will work forever because marketers can destroy these channels. For example, <laughs> when I started PR, I think uh, uh, many marketers can use the same efforts. So you need to stand out from the rest to be creative with that. So it doesn't matter. You need to go ahead to adapt. So I want to ask you, take your crystal ball and let us know what kind of future will be and how we can adapt today to this possible future. That's, you know, the future is, is, is definitely, as they say, the future is looking bright. So I got to wear shades to borrow from a, 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 a song, but, but I would say in, in my crystal ball, what I'm seeing is because what I'm seeing right now is there's a lot of creatives out there. A lot of people are putting themselves out there, but I think that there's a lot more people that are trying to hold back that they are, uh, they want to filter themselves. They want things to be perfect. They won't put themselves out there. And I see this in work as well. And when people work and they collaborate, a lot of people are afraid to say answers because they think their answer is stupid. They, they don't sound smart enough. They don't sound like other people. They don't look like other people. So I, I think one of the big takeaways is, is that the future is always going to look different than the present. So if you're going to go out and you want to be creative, you don't want to emulate what somebody is doing now because that's just a replication of what's happening. What you want to do is follow those steps and come up with something that's creative, something that you feel is unique and put it out there. Uh, so that's the most important thing is that the future will look different. And the only way you look different is to put out different messaging and put out something that's different and creative. W one of the things, if you looked at the last year's Super Bowl, all of the ads, they were all different, but they all felt the same. They all had the same style. They all were very choppy, very TikTok-like. Our minds had been kind of scattered by the concept of a scroll. And so we're now addicted to this rapid infusion of information and everything has become gamified. So I think the future is gonna look a lot slower. I think there's already a trend that's going on where people are stepping back. They're trying, one of the most popular things is people like to go away and they like to turn off their digital devices. People are starting to understand the value of sleep more as we discussed. So as a result, we're going to get back to a time before digital where creativity was really alive, where advertising told stories, where advertising was emotional. The emotion aspect of ads has, is an art that's been somewhat lost. Think about the shows and the movies that we love. Not ones that we just watch, but ones that really move us and get us at our core. The last time you watched something that made you tear up, the last time that something really made you laugh, something that can evoke emotion like that, that's the direction that advertising is moving because that's what human beings really need in order to connect. It's not about shoving out more messages in order to sell more stuff. It's about telling stories and getting those connections and getting people to feel what you and your brand are all about. And then when you connect to people and you connect in a real, in a real sense and you connect to their community, that's where magic happens. So I think we're going to see the trend, especially in these big live events like the Super Bowls, like the big football games, like the big award shows, we're going to see stories that are being told that we want to learn more for stories that are going to that are going to make us cry, that are going to make us laugh, because that's what marketing and advertising is all about. It's not about selling more stuff today. It's about connecting with someone and putting a message in the back of their head that makes them think about us. And that's that's the direction of where things are going. And so as a result, I think we'll see in the future platforms that are anti-TikTok, 
that are not about really fast ads, but more about moving slow. And I don't know what that's going to be, but that's that's what I think the future is going to hold. Yeah, nice. Love it. Love it. Awesome forecast. I love it. My <laughs> crystal ball doesn't work. I tried with crypto. I felt that crypto will go up. <laughs> it went down. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I agree with you 100% because uh, in marketing, it's very creative niche. And for example, marketers on TV and radio didn't lose their jobs. They adapted to digital. You know, right. It doesn't matter what kind of future will be. If SEO is that, you can adapt to any other channel. If uh, LinkedIn will be that, adapt to other channels. Right. You can switch your attention to any other channel. If you have experience with some specific digital marketing, you can adapt much faster and better than many others because of having this experience. SEO is not only how to create high quality, uh, I mean, like how to rank on Google. It's like, like how to create high quality content. You can, uh, Facebook is not only how to get engagement. You can get sales, anything. And if you have experience to write engagement posts, you can right for any other channel. <laughs> Jeff, it's a big pleasure to get in my show. Love it. So valuable. Um, tell the best way how to keep learning from you, how to reach out to you, how to follow you. Uh, the best way is uh, look for me on LinkedIn. Uh, go to our website, provalytics.com. Sign up. Take the free attribution certification course. You can go to attributioncertified.com. There's also links for me in LinkedIn. I love to connect uh, with other entrepreneurs and hear about their journeys. It's always exciting for me uh, to learn about. I, in fact, when I chat with folks, I always, I feel guilty. I always learn more from them than they learn from me. So I, I'm always available to chat with folks and, and absolutely love it. And it, exciting times ahead for all of us in the digital world. Nice, nice. Guys, you can find all the links in the description below, website, social media accounts, LinkedIn, by the way, I open LinkedIn account and I see interview with Bloomberg. So I, I'm going <laughs> to watch this interview. Interesting about that. Uh, guys, I recommend to anyone to follow Jeff because you can see a lot of value. Take courses, uh, learn a lot more because you can become much better marketer. Okay, guys, love you. See you.